Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. Uh, this is the end of the 2023 season. I can't believe it's already over. Of course, it's not actually over. we got lots of comps to go, but the end of the World Cup season is finally upon us. We're here to talk about the Wujang World Cup. I, of course, am Tyler Norton. Joining me, as always, is John Bergman from Climb... John? John, can you... Uh, John, can... John, wake up, buddy. John, third... Roland Garros is going to be commentated by climbers that didn't make it to semifinals, John. John. Alex Puccio. Alex Puccio is releasing a, uh, an album of uh, Neil Young covers, John. John, is that... Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I Did, I, did Wu Jang yeah. hit you that hard? Gosh, this comp put me to sleep. I'm sorry. I. Uh... Whew, good to see. You. Are we recording here? We we've Tyler? been recording for a little bit, yeah. But I'm I'm just glad you're still conscious that uh that comp might oh, have had man. fatalities. But uh, yeah, joining oh. me as always, John Bergman, writing the uh, the debriefs for uh, Climbing Magazine. Also writes for writes and records a great podcast for Climbing Business Journal, and of course the author of High Drama: The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. Now that we're all awake again. Um, I think I think you you pointed out the place to start with Wu Jang, which was uh, this was one of my least favorite comps to wake up for in recent memory. This one did not keep me intrigued. How, how are you feeling about it? I agree one hundred percent. I'm really curious to see what all of our viewers felt about this competition. I definitely noticed a lack of interest in it on the whole. Now, I here's an interesting thing though. I think. When I was putting together my recap of this yesterday, I sent it to my editor. I don't I don't know if it's been published yet, but the draft title was something like I think I titled it Japan and China look dominant in World Cup victories or something like that. And then just Reasonable. by sheer just by sheer coincidence, uh, this morning I was clicking through and I found Natalie Berry's UK climbing recap and she titled her recap Japan and China dominate IFSC World Cup lead and speed. So I say that because I think that <laughs> obviously that is the big takeaway. The big takeaway is how dominant Japan and China both looked. However, I don't think for our purposes here, that is the, the headline, quote unquote. I think the headline for me is something like World Cup season concludes, yet everybody has already checked out. That's what I really think the headline of this should be. And so I was thinking about all of the reasons, the perfect storm of everything coming together, why this comp didn't seem to really resonate with me, didn't really seem to resonate with you, didn't resonate with some of the other people I talked to. I mean, we kind of make make light of it, make a joke of it with with the sleeping and stuff, but it, it did it did. It was just kind of a snooze fest almost before it even happened, right? Like almost before we even knew it was taking place. So I want you to hold up a hand here. Let's go through the list of some of the reasons why we think okay. it was, well, well, hold up a fist, I guess. Don't, okay. No fingers yet. There we go. Okay, so okay. first of all, the, the reasons why I think this thing kind of fell flat. Probably most obvious, a lack of some of the biggest superstars, right? No Yanya. No Adamandra. Am you I counting go... climbers on these fingers, or is I think each just one for the superstars. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's a collective. <laughs> it's a collective superstar finger. Cool. So that that is the, one of the reasons why I think this one didn't resonate. Let's be honest. Yanya comes to a comp; it's a bigger deal. Adamandra comes to a comp, even though he doesn't have the consistent gold medals that Yanya does. He's, he's still just a superstar. A superstar. He comes to a comp; it's a bigger deal. They weren't there. That was a problem. Uh, what uh, we'll just trade off back and forth here. What's another reason why you think this one didn't resonate? Well, I always have to include this as a um, as a caveat because I feel bad projecting my own experience. But in this particular time zone, it is a killer for North Americans. It is like twelve hours off of my time zone, so that makes it tough. Um, the other thing I was going to say, uh, and I guess I could break this in different ways, but I'll start with uh, specifically the way the crowd came across on the stream, which was almost non-existent. It felt like we were watching some like elementary school fencing tournament. It, it sounded so unenthused. Uh, yeah, the, the, the audio from the event made it sound like nobody actually wanted to be there. That was a really big one for me. Uh, dovetailing with that, I actually didn't think the crowd was that bad. Although now that you mention it, I, I do think that's a good point. With that though, the production problems 
right? That makes it very frustrating. And eventually you kind of just give up when the live stream is glitching or non-existent at all, when the microphone audio is, is really bad or, or cutting out. So the production was bad. And also, I don't know, maybe it was just me. This venue looked terrible for holding a competition. It was just gray. It was dim. It was drab walls. I, I, I didn't know how to express this point, but it, it, it didn't feel festive. It didn't feel like an occasion at all. It felt like a gymnasium. I, I was thinking, is this a World Cup or, or or is this being held inside a hospital closet or something? It just the it just looked very bad on screen. I don't know what it was like to be there in person, but from a visual perspective on the live stream, not very compelling. So that's another. I, I don't know how many fingers we're up to, but uh, another thing I'll mention. That's three you or said four. The the time zone difference. Well, with that, for for American viewers, God bless the American speed climbers that decided to make that long trip over there but there were no americans in the lead disciplines at all men's or women's division so uh, no brooke no natalia we could put those with the superstars but then all the other people that we've seen throughout this this season jesse grouper colin duffy kyra condy uh, on and on annie sanders none of them showed up for for lead none of them wanted to make the the long trip i can't say i blame them so that's another finger that you can put up there um my my big last one was that it, this was supposed to be the end of, of two seasons. This is supposed to be the end of the speed season and the lead season. There is an element of like culmination that you want to feel when you're wrapping up a season that's lasted so many months when for the most part, the season titles have been up for grabs. And uh, this, this had no sense of occasion to it, like I kind of said earlier. And the results at the end of the season were... Also something a little bit hard to get excited about in some regards too. So I think it was a comp where not that expectations were necessarily high coming back to China for the first time in a long time. And, and China wasn't always known for like unbelievable crowds or unbelievable production and internet connections was like always something that used to be struggled with with Chinese comps in particular. Um, but expectations were a little bit higher. We wanted something else to act as the as, as the final event of the season, something to be a bit of a bookend, to, to be a bit of a fireworks show, to say, you know, like, look what we've been through. Look, look who's come out on top. And uh, it was really lackluster for, for an event that was supposed to be the finale, in a sense. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong to think about. Maybe that's not how I should think about this part of the world cup season anymore maybe the world after anything after the world championships is just an appendix dangling off the end of the colon which is the the, the world cup circuit i don't know man but it's uh it felt uh very underwhelming i think that is the crux for me that is the real a really good point there was just a lack of high stakes at this event because it's been a long season. We should mention that. that. That's another obvious point. It started back in April, I think, right? So April, May, June, July, August, September. We're half a year later, mm -hmm. right? That's that's too long, I would argue. And and I've said this, and I know I know you've said this for a long time. I think the season should be shorter. But we get to the end of it here in September, and world champions for this this year have already been decided. Uh, the Olympians, in terms of the Olympians that are decided with this uh, this World Cup season, in, in parallel to this World Cup season, those have already been decided. So it's just like, what is there left at this mm -hmm. competition on top of the fact that it's so far away, on top of the fact that the competitors are fo so fatigued, and I think the fans are kind of fatigued at this point. Uh, it just for there all is, of those reasons, it, it kind of fell flat. Mentioning the fatigue of, of the season, and I think because the World Championships really does act as like the the high point of the season rather than with the final comp of the year, it really messes with the flow and the enthusiasm. Like the, the the Plastic Weekly Discord has never been more dead for a comp than it is for the final comp of the year, especially when it's this late, when there's so few athletes, when there's so much other stuff to be paying attention to. And around here, the weather was good too. A lot of people just like not want to spend their weekend watching this stuff. Um, yeah, I feel you. Let me ask you this then. Let's We're both in agreement that the season was too long, that there was a lack of interest here. If you had the keys to the kingdom, how would you restructure the season to keep interest at a high, to keep enthusiasm and, and, and fatigue from, you know, keep fatigue from happening? What would your calendar look like for a World Cup season? I, with the caveat that 
that things change because the IFSC doesn't always get to choose who they want to host certain things and their calendar has to, you know, uh, um, interact with the calendar of international events, but also just national circuits, right? If the IFSC moved certain dates, that would have a huge effect on on a hundred national climbing federations now how they run their schedule so like and money of course gets into that but first thing i would do is world championships would always be at the end of the year and if that wasn't that easy i would make the world championships for each discipline broken up so it was the final event of the discipline at least so maybe your boulder world championship is at the end of june or like start of july or something um but i would make sure that there was some sense of culmination there i think that's the one like just simplest in terms of of like uh, of 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 concept and in terms of like theory you're like yeah that easily makes sense um it's a little bit uh, easier said than done especially if you try and do all three disciplines together like we've been trying to do in the combined era boulders haven't done a world cup since june right so are they going to come back out in late september or october according to this calendar to like get their shoes back on and and try again probably not but I think just little little things like that would make the, the season a lot more coherent and feel like it was building up to something. That among many other changes, but it just gets more and more unhinged the further down we go. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, would you do less World Cups? Um, I, I actually don't know if I think the season is too long. I just think there are periods where, um, like each World Cup is a lot of watch hours. And I think sometimes the World Cups are just like back to back to back on certain weekends at a time of the year in the northern hemisphere where it's kind of like people want to be outside on weekends and that's kind of tough um so yeah like our our finals are really long it's compared to other sports like our our events last actually quite a long time to uh, compared to some other sports right these streams are stretching into like three ish hours um depending on the time of the day that's just like totally unfeasible so i don't know if i would make the season shorter like i i'm the kind of person that wants to watch as much really good climbing as possible um so if you get me all the climbers there for all those comps then i'm down for probably every single one um but yeah that brings us to the next question which was was this event good i guess (laughs) you said you want to watch good climbing and so like meaning like the finals i suppose the final rounds here how did you feel about the results as they played out once the event? Yeah, was and I, I, this is this is a part where it is kind of, uh, um, you know, if I was an event organizer and I looked at how this event worked, I think there was a lot of strong suits. I thought the separation was very good. I also think, to me, for the most part, the best climbers made it to finals, and for the most part, the best climbers got to the podium. And I thought the the breakdown of the separation and who was on top was actually pretty logical. So I think the climbing or the route setting was actually quite good, even though it was hard in finals, probably like a bit too hard. Um, I I still think it like served its purpose, so that was good. Um, I don't know what the scheduling was like on the ground, but the viewer experience, especially in semifinals, was a disaster. Um, it's like completely unacceptable for, for high level competition. Um, this did not feel like a high level comp and that's kind of a, a, a qualitative evaluation. Again, it did feel like it was, was like, you know, high school level sports. Um, but that's, that's really discouraging. And then starting finals and, you know, the stream comes on, you know, and then you see that same French notice saying like connection lost or whatever. I was like, oh man, I can't do this again. And fortunately it was short lived. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think uh, from from a viewer side, there were no real super fun storylines in terms of, uh, you know, a one final clash at the end of the season. Um, the, the broadcast itself didn't feel very exciting at all due to the type of climbs we had, which were like low falls and not much actual progression through a lot of it. The crowd didn't seem very engaged. It didn't seem like there was there was any kind of energy coming from the stream. There's only so much that the commentators can do in that case. Like it's really hard to carry a broadcast when the show is slow and the backing energy is slow. That's brutal. So yeah, this was probably the worst comp of the year for me. Yeah, I think I was kind of pondering what it would be like if this event as everything played out the final rounds that we got the results that we got if you would just position this wujang event in the middle of this season i kind of think we would have been a little more hyped for the results that we got in the sense that look this adds to serato the men's division the men's lead final adds to what we've said all season this storyline of serato i mean certainly being kind of like the breakout rookie of the year but also 
looking more and more like somebody who could could very probably be a superstar in the next few years if he can keep this level up. I mean, he's just he, he's just so clearly the best when he's on his game. He's so clearly the best in the men's lead division. So I think in in the sense there, I think the men's final was actually really satisfying. I think the women's final, regardless of when this would have happened during the season, at this point, if you have Imori winning, but Yanya is not in the final, it means so much less because we know that the two of them are are, are kind of like so closely coupled together in their skill level. Uh, it, you want to see them both battling, and if you just we've been through this before, right? It's kind of deja vu where we see one one of them is here and the other one isn't, and then the, the other one's here and the other one isn't. It's like at this point, uh, it, I don't know. That just doesn't that rings kind of hollow to me as much as a it was a great performance from Imori and better than everyone else. It, it has that little asterisk by it that's like, gosh darn, I, I really wish Yanya was here. Yanya really needed to be here for us to know like how good, what, how much better was Imori than the rest of the field? We need Yanya to be that. It was, for- it was the kind of thing where the favorites were favorites by quite a long stretch. And so there really wasn't going to be any, um, any intrigue unless people made mistakes, right? Like Jane Kim, you could possibly say, didn't have like an excellent climb, but a lot of people fell in that sequence. It was just a cruxy low sequence on the men's side. Yeah, again, Serato is definitely by far the best climber. And so who would you expect on a regular day to to match him in this field? And I would say probably nobody, right? So, so again, like not a lot of entry going into it and very little came out of it as well. Let's put the spotlight on Jane Kim for a second sure. because her season, I, I wrote this. I want to read something here if I could pull it up. I wrote this in my recap. Um, so, well, I guess for, for starters, let's just point out in case people don't have the results in front of them. So she got seventh place here at Wujang and she, let's see, I'm looking at my notes. She, she had a kind of a surprising low fall, 20 plus. She was shooting up for a left hand and she kind of hit the volume too low on the edge. It was one of those black... Uh, half spheres and she hit it too low and she fell uh, a little bit lower than certainly lower than I was expecting her to fall and she seemed quite surprised herself and so I wrote in my recap I said panning out there is perhaps no competitor who had more of a complicated season than South Korea's Jian Kim in a performative sense from the highest of highs coming out of retirement winning a gold medal to the lowest of lows such as this kind of shockingly low fall at Wujang. 35-year-old Kim remained a fan favorite and is undoubtedly a legend, but we also saw more variation in her results than ever before. So one big question for myself and many fans is whether or not she will be back for another season next year. Uh, I, I think she's still a gold medal contender in any event she's in, but we, we saw, my point is, we saw a lot more inconsistency with her this year than we ever have. And I'll, I'll just rifle through Wu Jang here, seventh place Coper uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, she was 20th. Also very low considering the legend that we're talking about. She didn't have a great world championships in the lead lead discipline. She was 13th. Again, I think like a lot of people, I would have expected her to be a little higher there. Well, let me, let me, cause I, I think my, my angle with Jane Kim is, is I think she's, been actually pretty consistent probably and it is just there have been a couple little outliers like the 20th and coper in terms of results like not that crazy not that far down 34 years old and you made semifinals like it's, it's all pretty good but then the first place as well is also absolutely what i would consider an outlier right like she she got that high on the climb and none of us thought she was going to win it it was like oh my god she's actually going to win this thing as the rest of the field kind of fell apart around her and and cheyenne so in particular made that uh rope error and and you end up with a gold medal in your lap i don't i actually i don't think i agree in terms of uh of her consistency i think the consistency is like right about there in terms of how she's performing probably for the most part doesn't seem that unreasonable just a couple like little like in terms of where that climbing ended her up due to root setting or other like extraneous stuff kind of put her with some results that were um, outliers. But I think she's been pretty consistent in my opinion. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's a good point. But I, I guess one of my larger takeaways is, look, this is a new era where Giant Kim does get consistently, to your point, gets consistently 13th place, 14th place, right? Like in the teens. That is not where we would have expected Giant Kim to necessarily be 
pre-retirement, maybe a couple years before retirement, right? Sure. Where it's like Giant Kim is going to make the finals. She's probably going to make a podium. She probably will even win unless she gets beat by Yanya, Cheyun, that type of thing, right? And so right. I guess one of the questions I have now, especially looking to later seasons, this year coming out of retirement, was this year and getting 13th place and 14th place, that consistency there, consistency in the teens, is this just Giant Kim kind of working off the rust a little bit? Or is this the new era of Giant Kim where she she is just, for the most part, going to be in the teens? And that's totally fine, right? Because I'm I'm all fine with just like, hey, I want to go watch her climb anyway because she's a legend. I don't care if she doesn't get a podium or doesn't win. It's it's almost like you want to see Michael Jordan playing for the Wizards, right? right it's like sure. he, it's not the Michael Jordan from the Bulls, but he still fills out the stadiums because fans just know they want to see this guy in person play, and it doesn't matter the quality or the caliber. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what do you think? Where where are we at with Giant Kim here? I I I I think she's the kind of climber where I look through almost like a bit of a Sean McCall lens because that always makes me be thankful for what I have. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I mean, Sean McCall's in it because he loves it. There are still goals that are worth trying to achieve, trying to get to those Olympics, which Jane Kim is absolutely still trying to achieve. Um, and if you're enjoying it, and if you can do it, I say, why not, right? Like it's for, for us Canadians, a good day is having one athlete make it to semifinals. And lately, more often than not, that is not Sean McCall. Um, but he's still one of the very best that we have. And we're happy to see him out at comps. And, and when he has good performances, then that's something great for us to celebrate. So I think if you then have an athlete who on their good day can make finals, right and and still has it in them to possibly get a medal you know once every couple of years like that's extra impressive and i would say yeah that's that's a perfectly reasonable standard for somebody who started competing 20 years ago yeah absolutely i i guess i just wonder at this day and age when you see giant kim's name on a roster mm -hmm. as exciting as it as it is for the reasons you just pointed out like it's still great to have her there but do you think in your head, look, when you see Yanya on the roster, you're like, okay, that's a probable finalist, probable podium, right? Probable for, for first, Yanya. Unless, yeah. Yeah, unless yeah. something goes wrong. Yeah. When you see I Mori on a lead roster, you're thinking that's a probable podium unless something goes yeah. wrong. And you could riff off another uh, a number yeah. of other competitors. When you see Giant Kim's name on the roster, I am still in this mindset where I'm thinking, oh. okay, that is, that's Giant Kim. That is a probable podium or fourth place fifth place like she's still there every time i see it right it sounds like maybe you're think you maybe you don't have that same reaction that yeah. you did back you're still in living in a fantasy world that's the, that's the problem it's got nothing to do with jane kim yeah <laughs> uh, yeah no i think of her as like kind of a finalist bubble i guess is is where i'm at right now um which yeah. is still great but yeah I, I i mean i certainly like when you see your name on the thing you're like yeah anything can happen with this particular climber but i think in in reality if i you know the way we've kind of ranked boulders in terms of tiers with you know yanya's 1a natalia's 1b and then second tier is like orianne brooke etc i think jane kim is quite a few steps down although on the lead side those tiers get shuffled up and quite bunched up very quickly right like below uh below yanya and um I Mori that there is just a broad range of people where you're like, okay, pick six, pick six more from this batch of like probably almost like 15, 20 names that can reasonably make a finals about 50% of the time. So yeah, it's a little harder to distinguish for sure. It's, it's a, this new era of actually, it's kind of more exciting watching giant Kim because nothing is a given, right? Like sure. you, 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 with somebody like Yanya or I Mori or whatever, you, you're, you're kind of, I don't want to say you like check out obviously, but like, it's easy to just think like, okay, they're going to get to like near the high point. Right. And mm -hmm. then like, and then we'll see what happens with giant Kim. It's a lot bigger of a question mark. And I don't say that. I know that sounds like a negative, but it's almost a little, no, like I said, it's all. a little more yeah. exciting. You're like, she might win this thing or she might fall at 20 plus. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't know what you're getting. It's kind of a lottery ticket seeing giant Kim on the roster. And I think that that's a, that's some fun intrigue for 2023. And I really, I mean that in a positive way with all sincerity. I don't mean that I, I don't, I, I kind of say her, her skills or her, like your expectations for her have diminished a little bit. And that sounds like a bad thing, but I guess my point is it actually kind of makes it more exciting for a, for a viewer. Fair enough. Let me, let me pose a, a similar question about another female legend. If, if only near legend, um, uh, Alexandra, uh, not Kaluchka, <laughs> Alexandra Miroslav, who, 
now after a couple competitions, we're starting to see fall again and, and still obviously an incredible speed climber putting up the best times. Um, but uh, not not making it through to the semifinals in this case uh, today, having a slip on the very first move, you know, she she pulls off the start, left foot doesn't even hit the foothold. Um, how how are we feeling about this climb, or what what do you think? Like, I mean, she locked her Olympic berth in uh, at Rome just last fr- Friday um, with an extraordinary performance. Pretty, sure, if I remember right, there was a new world record from her as well, in like the six twos or something. I think this is the tightest the men's and women's records have been in quite a long time. She is really driving women's speed climbing but what do you what do you think what's your impression like do you think she's uh stepping off the gas a little too much do you think this is maybe a a, a balance she's needed to strike where it takes some pressure off better for your mental health better for long-term performance i don't know if you have any thoughts or or were you surprised i was not surprised i i guess we should be more surprised in hindsight that she went so long without for any, sure. any mistakes right i i think that watching the men's division and the men's world records in particular and the Indonesians in particular like Vedrik and, and Kiramal okay those guys we know they they can hold the world record the men's world record and yet we do see them slip all the time right mm-hmm. like and we don't really think anything of it we're like yeah that's just kind of the price you pay if you're trying to go that fast and you're capable of going that fast as Vedrik and Kiramal are you're gonna slip I, I don't have the percentages in my you know, in front of me, obviously, but it's like, you're going to slip half the time, right? That's just going to happen. That's speed climbing. So I I almost think like now, okay, now maybe Miroslav is like uh, approaching human normalcy where Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. Okay. Now she's back to where she it's, it's normal to be if you're a world record holder, which is sometimes you slip, sometimes you don't. uh, and, And, but a lot of times things don't go as planned. I think it's almost like we were just spoiled for so long that she was so, uh, like, otherworldly consistent in not messing up that's not a standard that anybody could maintain it was only a matter of time till she started slipping i don't think that diminishes anything from her skill level from her expectations that you have when you see her on the roster i I just think um it it almost aligns her more with what we've seen from the male world record holders for the past couple years now well, I, I think you're right just in terms of it's completely unreasonable to ever expect this kind of consistency from speed climbers. It's just such a high risk sport. But I think I think people that maybe have started watching speed climbing in the last, you know, year or two probably are gonna have to rejig their expectations from what to think about the sport because she is really kind of uh, warped what reality looks like in speed climbing there's no such thing as consistency like that right especially two seasons kind of in a row even though she skipped a lot of competitions when she shows up she's just immaculate um yeah i i think it's uh and who knows what happens when we get to next year and when the olympics is in focus maybe we see her almost like not at all maybe we see her at barely any comps i don't know what the schedule is going to be next year either but like it's possible that this little two season era of her perfection is over and we never see it again or maybe she finds that that gear that no one else has been able to find and you're just you know your personal best is so far ahead of everyone else that you can win any race putting in just 90 percent, whereas everybody else is reaching for 110 um it's so hard to say but like what a what an era for us to get to witness like what a crazy little period of speed climbing that's it's cool like i mean just in the in the five seasons that we've done this we've seen yanya do the impossible with bouldering and we've seen alexandra miroslav do the impossible speed climbing possibly like the the best ever bouldering performance in history and possibly the best ever speed performance in history like and we got to watch them both and talk about them on this and it was it was deceptive perfection, I think, from Miroslaw in the sense of, look, I think the best thing she did to make us all have this impression that she was so flawless is she did do comps so intermittently, right? Mm-hmm. In other words, I think if you just look at this, the likelihood and the stats, if she had done more comps throughout the past couple of years, I'm sure we would have seen her slip much earlier than we did. Now, credit to her. I don't mean to take anything away from her because she still had to perform flawlessly on the the couple of events that she did participate in. And maybe there was more pressure in that sense. But you look back and, and you're like, wow, she was perfect for two years. That is impressive. I mean, that's incredible. But then you're like, well, but really how many competitions in that two years 
was she perfect at compared to how many competitions she could have entered, right? Yeah. And so I I think that that was a, I don't know if she intended it, but that was like a savvy move on her part in terms of building her legacy because look, if you only if you only show up for like a couple of comps a year and you do great in them, let's say for 5 years, then you you don't just look and say, yeah, I did great in a couple comps. You can spin it like, look, I did great for five years. Right? Undefeated it's all, it's for all five about, years or whatever. Yeah. 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 That's, that's how the, you sell it. And yeah. she, she did a, she was wise to, to do that. I, I think it, it, it definitely gave her some longevity that we, and now instead of just talking about her being perfect for a couple comps, a few comps, which is, I don't mean to diminish it. Like it was a, a, a fair number of events, but we are phrasing it as like, wow, she was perfect for, years two years and it's like let's well, let's do a series where we take the biggest accomplishments of a bunch of athletes lives and just like emphasize all the asterisks around it and we you know we can just just like literally just diminish their achievements <laughs> like well because of this and because of this and because of this i, you know, I hope people interpret i hope people know what we're we're not diminishing this or we're not intending to make it that way i mean I, I, like you said her what she has done in speed climbing is perhaps one of the best accomplishments that the sport will ever see between between the actual medals which is quite easy to see if, if you just like look at results and stuff if you pull up her profile and you just see the strings of ones right down down the rank order um but when you combine that with how she she's i don't i not enough of an aviation nerd to know what the comparison is but like she is i don't know why i took it this angle into a place i know nothing about she's she is breaking the world record so often and so singularly it is just her and she is she is the she's beyond the tip of the spear right she is she's ahead of that she has pushed speed records forward faster and further than anybody else has in history. And it was just a couple of years ago that I was singing Yulia Kaplina's praises as the greatest female speed climber in modern speed climbing. So, so many asterisks just there, like female only, just modern speed climbing. But she's she is she has really taken the sport in the last two years and entirely made the discipline her own. And her name is synonymous with over at this point over a half second of world records being broken in just a couple of years that's that's a huge span to just own the world record all by yourself it it is crazy um so yeah and, and, but between the two the medals and the speed records are like nobody matches that since the homologated wall came around and timing is everything i don't mean no pun intended I, like timing is everything in the sense of the era that she is doing this as well is the mm. climbing's boom period speed climbing, climbing has never been more competitive than this speed climbing has never been more competitive it has never had as big of a media platform or, or attention as it does now because of the olympics because now especially it's being uh, separated into its own discipline at the olympics you and i always talk about how it's such a shame that all those accomplishments in comp climbing in the lead discipline and whatnot and and, and speed too from like you know the early 2000s or the 90s as great as they were, it's just the timing. The timing wasn't what it is now, right? There's no video footage of it. There's no social media to have these world records buzzed around. And, and again, the every most climbs were different. And what does a world record mean? It meant almost nothing. It was like, oh, yeah, you have the world record for this particular gym in Siberia. You did it two years in a row. Congrats. Like there's there was almost there's no carryover. There's no consistent storyline, right? It is just about medals. Yeah. And and. Miroslaw has the perfect timing to happen to be the she is the the one right she is the the queen of the speed climbing and she happens to be doing that just as speed climbing is sort of going from the underground to the mainstream yeah. so to speak to use the music metaphor and it's all just worked out in in her favor so back to your original point i don't think it means anything if she slips let her slip as much as she wants if she keeps <laughs> chipping away at that world record i'm yeah. all for it yeah uh we should we should just talk let's take a moment to talk about china just in actually no i guess the the topic we should actually talk about is a little bit more fun than than trying to make salient points about athletes that we've only ever actually paid attention to once so of course when a world cup is hosted in a particular country that country gets to send extra athletes to the event um, and so you get to bolster your team in front of the home crowd and Japan and China and Indonesia, when they host their World Cups in particular, send 
a murderer's row of athletes. Indonesia and China apparently in speed just have a never ending well of incredible talent, not just winning races because a lot of people from Europe didn't show up. Remember, like Europe is becoming less and less of a factor in speed climbing. This is becoming an Asian sport. Um, and and China was just packing these finals. It was unreal. Um, you you threw a, a, a random question about how I would change the format at me earlier, so I don't feel bad doing the same to you. Um, what approach should we take when we realize that some of the best climbers in the world never get to compete at World Cups because countries like China have a cap put on them um, where they can only send like, you know, four or five climbers to each World Cup when we know they've got like another 10 sitting in the wings that are better than most countries send as their first seed? What do we how do we change the circuit? So that's not happening. That's a yeah. good question. Now, how I, does it feel? How does yeah, it feel to I, <laughs> reevaluate the entire competition circuit on I, the fly? I don't think I would be an advocate of allowing more competitors to enter these events because I think that they have. We always, you were saying at the top of this show that the events are too long. They're three plus hours, right, for the live streams. Well, if you have more competitors, you're going to have to just lengthen the the time that these comps take to to do during a weekend. So I. Even if these countries like China, like Japan, they they have this assembly line of talent. I don't know if the answer in terms of letting that talent perform, I don't think it's as easy as just saying, OK, just let them all in. Right. Like take away the cap. Let as many competitors. I don't I don't think that that would be the, the wise answer, because then that would uh, you, you think a, a three hour live stream is too long. How about a six and a half hour live stream to get through? Dozens I'm, not, I'm not crazy enough to watch the speed qualification in real time, though. That's that takes a special kind of person. Shout out to those guys in the Discord. You, I, you got I suppose, one up on me lately. I suppose the answer here, the logical answer, is to have some sort of sub set of World Cup, like a world, like a a sub World Continental Cup. Cups. By that's what by I'm saying. Any yeah, chance? That's what I'm saying. Like a, a you, it's it's feels like a world cup but it's only the continental rosters and that provides a feeder system for who goes to the world cups now that, that it's not an easy thing to do because you're going to have to hype up the continentals and i think we've seen particularly you and i with the north american cup series that there's a it's, it's a real problem getting people interested in those when they don't have the the big name like like for example let's take uh, let's say since we're talking about china and japan let's say there was an asia continental cup that was going to become a feeder system for the world cup and would would every asian country then have to send all their people or could some people be kind of like given a buy into the world cup circuit so somebody like a miho or back in the day like an akiho uh, akio would they have I've already the forgotten her name <laughs> would, would they have or tomoa or anybody would they have to do the continentals or would they get a buy into the just the world cup because i say that because if they don't get the if they do get the buy then you're gonna have a hard time selling tickets and garnering interest when it's an asian continental and yet tomoe is not there and miho is not there and uh yoshiyuki is not there right and uh, or or da lee juan dang and like all these names that people know are the best of the best you have to make it mandatory that they go to the continentals and well, I, I was just going to throw it like what, what makes the Continentals different right now. And, and you and I see this happen in North America is when like Canadian climbers, for instance, go to a North American Cup Series event. What they're fighting for is points to hopefully get a spot on the Canadian team. So they are competing really ultimately just against other Canadians. They're trying to get points so they have more points than other Canadians. So if you have that same system out in Japan, for instance, where the Japanese team doesn't get any bigger, but you're trying to earn more points than Tomoa and Yoshiyuki and Serato and all those guys, that is a, a you know, that is a, a, a tall hill to climb. <laughs> I don't know why the turn of phrase escaped me. But I, I think what, what you're kind of edging towards and what I think the IFSC system is slowly edging towards too, based on the quota changes they made this year, is when I go to a North American Cup series, I'm looking for points not to get on the Canadian team, but to become like a top 100 global athlete. So I don't need to do better than, well, for instance, a Japanese climber doesn't have to do better than Yoshiyuki Ogata. He just has to do better than me in Canada. He has to knock me out of the top 100 and and him get into the top 100. And we're not there yet, but I think based on how they're changing the 
continuous uh, updated world ranking and based on the quotas, which for this season became far more reliant on your ranking in previous seasons compared to just like Canada sending their top five or whatever. I think it is slowly going that direction and it is certainly going to be driven by countries like China and like Indonesia who and, and Japan who have extraordinary talent and and their 10th seed wipes the floor with our first seed most often and some of these and that's not an exaggeration right like that is that is legit um, they've got 10 athletes better than our best yeah the the challenge with this system which like you said it seems to be that th- that's maybe what we're moving towards first of all you're essentially make adding more comps when we were just saying that like are there too many right like you're you're just now you're I don't, I don't need to more. like but like it's like I mean you 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 watch tennis all the time that's an important sport to you how much tier two tennis do you watch it's your choice right and sometimes you get the huge stars will go down to, I don't know how you refer to it as like a tier one event or I guess the majors and then there's other stuff or whatever but you pick and choose your battles right like I'm here for the tier one stuff and, and I'll occasionally watch some tier two counter-strike for example if there's like a Toronto team competing yeah I'll go down and watch but otherwise I just watch the best stuff and hope the the local guys qualify yeah and and I'm glad you mentioned tennis because here's the challenge that tennis is always running into is these these lower so there, in tennis, there are events that are worth different amounts of points. They're right. 250, 500, 1,000, and then the big ones that everybody knows are, I think, 2,500. And so these smaller, really smaller 250 events, 500 events, it's always a, tr- uh, it's always a problem getting robust crowds. Sure. And so as a result, these events are always moving because it's like a sponsor's like, hey, you don't have any crowds in that city, come to our city. You don't have any sponsors in that city, you don't have a crowd in that city, come to our city. And so it's always it's this numbers game and this this uh, this finance game. It becomes all about sponsors paying for you to come to their city. And that's with tennis. That's with a sport that is way, way more popular, I think, globally than uh, than comp climbing. And so it's like if, if a talk, sport talk like, about a sport that has problems with long games, though, like so, that's that's yeah, a nightmare sport for man. sure. And I'm not saying I'm not here to say that tennis doesn't have some its own its own challenges and whatnot. But the yeah. point is, it's like if a sport like tennis is having trouble getting people to come to those events comp climbing is going to have enough to justify right having these continentals i think that that would be a real struggle and especially when you think of what is the the one thing that will get the crowds to want to come to these events yanya andra these it goes back to the star power thing that we were talking about and if it's a, a comp with international flair but those big names are not there it becomes how do they sell this thing to the masses? How do they get people to come other than the diehards? Like you and I and the people watching this and the people in the Discord, we would go no matter what because mm-hmm. we're like, hey, this is this is going to be an awesome continental battle. But to grow the sport, to get more people to it, I don't know. I don't know if the people would come to Make these. the athletes pay. That's always the answer. Because yeah. they're all so, so rich. Yeah, all exactly. The, all the comp climbers yeah. are uh, just flowing in. Yeah, right. Yeah, you can you can pay your uh, you can pay your entrance fees and it, with, just with friction labs, all that free chalk you get. Just, yeah, yeah. 20 yeah. ounces of chalk gets you an entry. <laughs> it's a real, it's a, this is a good point that you bring up, though, about, uh, look, uh, you do have these countries like Japan and China that have such a wealth of talent. How do you get them to be a part of all this? Uh, because because you should this should matter if you're somebody who says I want the best talent I want the best climbers to be competing in these competitions right mm. and then you look at a country like Japan and China and all these and you're like well yeah they some of the best climbers can't even get on the team because mm. they're 10th or 20th in the country or whatever um It'll be interesting to see how it develops in years to come. Yeah, for sure. I want to actually give a, a quick shout out to, uh, uh, I'll butcher the name, but Yunshul uh, Shin from Korea, I think with his fourth place this weekend, that is the highest ranking a Korean speed climber has ever achieved in history. So hats off for pushing that boundary. Japan, as we talked about, has been has been getting better and better in speed climbing. Ryo Amasa again on the on the podium this time around. Uh, but yeah, Korea uh, making some strides as well. And we've seen their names more consistently in the speed events and and now they're inching closer and closer to those medals. So maybe maybe next season's going to be a big one. Maybe there'll be some hardware at the end of that speed rainbow. So uh, yeah, just a quick shout out there. Um, John, do you have anything comp specific? Otherwise, I want to start talking about the the season overall World Cup championship award trophy, whatever it's called. Well, I, I think 
I have one question that I wanted to pose to you about somebody who happened to win the overall season trophy. So, <laughs> so we should so we should clearly the, switch over. Yeah, let that be the teaser, and uh, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, let's talk about the overalls. Well, where do you want to start then? Because I feel like you you might have the place to begin. Do you want to start with by any chance women's lead rankings? I do. Yes. Do you? Okay. Cool. Let me just I'll pop it up on the screen just uh, just for illustration's sake. There is your uh, 2023 lead World Cup overall series championship award, whatever we're calling it. Jessica Pills, first place for first time ever, getting uh, gold over the season. Yanya Garnbrett misses out on, what does she have, five five gold seasons, I think? Could have been her six, yeah. but she didn't show up, so peace. And then Vita Lukin in third place, followed by a bunch of other folks. I'm Ori Natsuki Tani, Jane Kim. Cheyenne Su, Mia Krampel, Nana Hakume. Um, let's talk about winning the 2023 World Cup season with two silvers and a bronze. How does that hold up historically? What uh, what do we? Th- where I don't even know where my mouse is right now. There we go. What do we think about that historically? Two two silvers and a bronze, and you're on top, baby. Does that feel? I guess the the question you were probably going to pose to me was, does it feel like Jessica Pills was the best climber of 2023? Well, I, yeah, or I was going to say it more assertively that this was, it's weird. Look, all credit to her, right? She wins it and and she's had some great Nobody cheated. Like everything, this is all entirely above board, right? This is like what we're going to be discussing is like a systemic issue. Nothing to do with Jesse Pills, not trying to take away anything from her. And I think Jesse is very savvy and understands how she achieved what she got and, and, you know, she, she understands all that stuff and she's still happy with it and that's fine. Yeah, and but I think the issue becomes, look, I think it was just the previous episode we were talking about, does anybody care about these overall season awards, right? And I think this illustrates a very logical reason why people don't care. And the people don't care because the the best, quote unquote, doesn't win it, right? And And above all, I think awards should be a meritocracy. The best should be awarded the biggest award, right? She and got the you, most points, John. She got the most points. Doesn't she have the most points? She does have the most. This is why, but this is why it's like, you're like, this is a weird award that like people kind of have to give these caveats with because I don't think, look, nine times out of 10, again, I, like all credit to Jesse Pills, but nine times out of 10, does she be, or not, that's not fair. Uh, you know, <laughs> she, she does not. That's the answer is no. She does you, whatever name you're going to put after that. Yeah, you have a a three three person competition between I Mori, Jessica Pills, and uh, Yanya Garnbread. Uh, you know, maybe Jesse wins two out of ten. Right? What do you think? Less. Like, uh, yeah, right? Probably two out of ten times. Um, I think most people, especially if they've been following the circuit for the last couple of years, would say unequivocally Yanya is a better quote unquote lead climber than Jessica Pills and I Mori is a better lead climber in a competition sense than Jessica Pills and I think if people disagree with that I think the results if you would line them up probably would affirm that so you have Jessica Pills winning the overall season award and yet I think most logical people would think but Yanya is a better lead climber and I Mori is a better lead climber. So you're like, what does this really mean for the, like, what is the average fan supposed to do with this award then? Right? Yeah. <laughs> like what? Totally. I, that's the, that's the crux of the overall season awards. Sometimes it works out great. Like you have somebody like Yanya. It usually, maybe. it usually works out quite well, but we're entering like in some new territory with this Olympic stuff and, and what's important. So I guess the question is like, who's, who is ruining this award? Is it the athlete's fault? Is it the, the structure of the awards fault? Like, why is this becoming less and less coherent as like a reason? And I should say some, some of the categories like uh, uh, men's lead, men's bouldering feel quite, logical this year around right like you you look at serato winning those and that seems to make sense in the speed climbing it's a little bit all over the place although vedrick winning uh uh winning the men's one just feels like that makes sense as well even though he wasn't you know uh uh 
Anyway, yeah. It, it um, is not uh, – 100%. It is not the athlete's fault. And, again, we it's, like, worth reiterating. Like, all credit to Jesse Pills. She plays within the system, and she wins by the rules that are established for this system. She wins the award. I think the, the criticism is entirely – the system and the accumulation of points. It's, it kind of reminds me of, think back to 2019 or whatever, tw- whenever, like, the, 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 when the Tokyo 2020 Olympics were approaching. Mm-hmm. And you had all that discussion about the combined format and how best to find a winner of that format, right? right. And remember, like, the thinking was, okay, if you just add up the the points or whatever, if you just do like a, a an adding system for the three disciplines, lead, speed, and boulder, like that won't suffice. So they, they came up with this convoluted system where you're multiplying their place in each discipline, right? And that was the that was the way that they deemed was a, a better system. You gotta wonder, should they, and I think they should, come up with some better math, some better system for awarding the overall season winner because just simply doing what we have here with the accumulation of points and this is this is an example of why that is faulty because you end up with somebody like jessica pills beating better climbers yeah i i i I, in general i'm i'm where you're at which is the the structure of this award doesn't align with what i think the the intent of the award is to represent consistent high performance right but consistency means we're going to be measuring how many times you actually show up at events and athletes are no longer showing up to events because they're not incentivized to Um, and so it kind of sends it all for a loop and it is now in getting closer and closer to being an attendance award Um, so you can talk about you know the the points drop off where first place is you know a thousand points and that just slowly drops off um maybe we need to make that steeper and you say okay first place is a thousand points second place is only you know 600 for example and it, it, and it really really drops off um but it's really hard to to actually you know accurately well not accurately but like you're, you're always going to advantage or disadvantage somebody based on how you you know make an arbitrary point system um i don't know do we only count medals like you don't get points for anything below medals you say we only count first second and third um and anything lower than that like doesn't even count I, I, a good example somebody pointed out to me was um f1 which i'm sure everybody's familiar with so n- not only are the points quite top heavy and not only do they have the benefit of like every driver i think has to be at every race like it's not really an option um but only the top 10 top 10 drivers from each race actually get points right so you don't get anything for lower performances maybe you say something like that like if you're not if you don't make finals you just don't get points for it at all those will address some of our concerns but not all of them but yeah it's a tough one not all i i just think that the whole idea consistent high performance right Mm -hmm. um okay at the end of the season let's say uh, we're speaking more hypothetically here. Let's say the winner of this at the end of a season is like, yeah, I got a silver medal in every competition I entered this year In every competition this year, I was the second best 2018 baby. Miho Nanaka. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Real example, life. Right, with Mio Real in life. Two years ago. It's like, okay. Like, so you were the second best. Like, I don't care about that. Right. Like, because it doesn't mean anything. You're not the best. You were uh, like, and you you try to verbalize this, and you come across as being very critical of these competitors, which we're not. Like I can't stress this enough. Like these competitors are doing what the system is. But I'm just saying, on a visceral level, if you say if fans would look at this and say, "Hey, this person was a bronze medalist every time this year," mm-hmm. it's like, okay, like that. So, yeah, we want we want some kind of satisfaction that feels coherent in, in our brains and we, we want it to feel like it makes sense to us, even though sometimes, you know, what actually makes sense doesn't quite correlate with how we feel about things. And I think that's really normal. Um, and you see that in sports all the time where where it's, you know, nobody can really argue the, you know, the um, nobody can argue the rules. No one can argue the result, but it just feels bad sometimes when you have one person win over somebody else. That comes up with our discussions of of I Mori and Yanni Garnbrett all the time. It's very emotional in in both directions for for good or for bad. Um, let, let me let me ask you. Go with your gut here. All right. First thing that comes to mind. You have two options. Would you rather no gold medals, but you win a, an overall season, or would you ha- rather win one World Cup gold medal? 
Oh, you're asking me what I would prefer to, if I was an athlete? On your, in your trophy case, do you have a trophy for overall season winner or a World Cup gold medal? Let's say the World Cup, let's say the overall came with no, <laughs> with no golds. So, okay. So I have the choice of a single, like a, like an Innsbruck gold medal mm-hmm. versus having the overall, um, that's a really good, and you know what? Honestly, I would have said. I think I still say overall, except Ooh, that they're just such really? unimpressive trophies. It's really annoying. But I, I think like uh, I think a lot of people have. I, for me at least, a lot of people have World Cup gold medals. Not many people have season medals, so I think it is a rare achievement, and that's why I still care about this award. Like I wouldn't otherwise, but it has historically been the hardest award to earn. Um, because you have to put in so much climbing to get it. The world championship is more rare. It is, you know, less frequently awarded, but it doesn't take much more effort aside from showing up just like a regular World Cup. So I would still probably lean to overall, but it leaves me open to criticism about how I actually earned it for sure. Like I, I don't argue with that at all. Like if I wanted to to argue that I was better somebody sorry, better than somebody, it would be a lot easier to definitively beat them at a World Cup once than an overall event where I can say, oh yeah, I, I never actually beat you this season, but you know, I showed up more. Like, you know, if if I want to argue who is better this season, I'm Mori versus Jessica Pills, I would absolutely argue I'm Mori and I could easily say, well, yes, she beat Jessica Pills every time they competed against each other. And so Jesse won a bunch of, or did, okay at comps where I didn't attend like that doesn't mean anything I'm worried beat Jesse Pills at every single event yet I'm worried not even on the podium for the season this year even though she was part of the 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 duo that defined the year for lead climbing you hit me with a swerve there because I honestly I thought you were going to say you'd rather have a world cup gold medal and I think the difference for me let's imagine there's two knuckleheads in the year 2099 sitting around doing the debrief <laughs> You know, decades from now. Heads in a jar. He, yeah. I think that if, if Tyler Norton, let's say Tyler Norton won the overall, but he never won a gold medal. I think these 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 pundits years and decades from now would be sitting around and they'd look at Tyler Norton's results and they would say, yeah, he won the overall, but he never won a World Cup gold medal. And, and yet, if you did win a World Cup gold medal, I don't think anybody would be sitting around saying, yeah, but he never won the overall. I don't think people would. I don't think people would talk about that. I think. But they, I, I think would. The I would, would drop the list of climbers that have won World Cup gold medals with like fat asterisk, just like asterisk after asterisk, like beside them. Like there's a long list of people that have a World Cup gold medal that I don't actually. Res- Sorry, I was. I was gonna say don't actually respect that much as a climber. But people. I know what you mean. I know, you know what you what mean. I, mean? I don't think of them as uh, tier one climbers at at any point in their career. They were not tier one climbers. You have a gold medal. Congratulations. You won that comp. So. But but my point is i'm glad you said that because if you win an overall by hypothetically let's say you get a bronze medal in every event of the season you're not a tier one climber okay let me ask you a <laughs> we're just trading hypotheticals back and forth would you rather have jesse pills's 2023 overall trophy or would you rather have vita lucan's Brianson gold medal Brianson uh, gold medal any no day. Really? world cup gold medal yeah. okay yeah. Fair enough. Yep. But there, there's differences between us. I want to see okay. people in the comments what they would rather have. <laughs> I want to hear people's, uh, yeah, World uh, Cup gold medal, 100%, because you beat, you actually beat people. What is comp climbing, right? No, I at, agree, at its very yeah. essence, comp climbing is on this day, at this moment, you have to beat people. You have mm-hmm. to beat everybody to win that gold medal. That's what that's what we love about comp. That's why on a on a, like a kind of like a spiritual level, that's why we love comp climbing more so than outdoor climbing. Because outdoor climbing as great as it can be, the person doing it, doing like climbing jumbo love or whatever or biography, bibliography, it's like they can wait for the perfect conditions. They can wait till they have the perfect mindset. They can wait till there's nobody else at the crag, right? They can fine tune all those conditions to optimize their performance on comp climbing you have no control over that you have to show up on that day and beat everybody in that moment no questions asked that's why comp climbing is great so a world cup medal or a world championship or whatever is like the embodiment of that overall season medal or trophy i don't know i see it as yeah not quite the same and i think i i do wonder if 
if there was a bigger award or more fanfare behind this award, which which wouldn't necessarily just be a function of who won it. Like if if the recipe was different, where we treated it differently, if it had a bigger prize, um, maybe we would feel differently. And honestly, just even going back just to right before the Olympic process started. So if you take like 2018 kind of, kind of as the final year of it, I think I think you would probably disagree but because we had never really seen a World Cup overall be won by somebody who was actually quite middling through the year. Like Miho Nanaka is kind of a great outlier of somebody who I don't think won any comps in 2018, if I remember right, and just won like seven silver medals. Am I rem- I'm just checking really quick to make sure. Yeah, I'm let's not, pull, pull up uh, her, uh, her oh, stats Oh, sorry. Here. She, the very first comp of the year in Maringen, she came first. And then it was a string of second places. So it's not quite comparable. Um, I would actually have to double check to see if there is anybody uh, that's ever won an overall that didn't win any competitions. Um, that would take me a bit to actually figure out. But I think this is 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 kind of one of the first times where we're looking at it and being like, wow, this is a really unsatisfying win for this award. So it's actually been quite steady and, and mostly representative over time. This is the first time where we're really kind of confused by it. I should say that the women's speed climbing is, is a little bit similar as well this season. Serato was pretty spectacular, although his boulder win is less convincing than his lead win for the season. But that one kind of makes a little bit more sense in our brain. I think we're used to that. Um, but yeah, the women's side this year has been a little uh, a little hard to digest. Yeah, men's boulder, it's hard to say because men's boulder has been such a um, – we've had such a lack of, like, consistent winners mm. for the yeah. last couple years, right? It's like Medjdi yeah. wins a couple, like a Strato decade, wins yeah. a couple, and, like, yeah, go back and on and on. Um, and actually, th- I think that's the norm. I think the, the abnormality is having somebody like Yanya or Natalia Grossman a couple seasons who ago who is so dominant. But let mm. me let me throw something – let me throw a, a – kind of a curveball to you because this is something I was thinking of when I was when I was looking at the results of this lead season the overall do you consider is Jessica Pills a superstar and I say that because you mentioned Miho and I was thinking okay it's this the, the idea of stardom is interesting because you can be a star based on your results Yanya being the obvious example I think Brooke being an obvious example this season although in prior seasons, I think maybe there was like some other X factor there because, but you can also be a star not based on results, just star power, charisma, whatever you want to call it. You think of somebody like Miho is like the obvious example. Um, somebody like maybe even Alex Magos in a comp comp sense. Uh, and maybe you could even put Brooke prior to 2023 on that list, although she was an Olympian. So that's kind of the, 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 uh, a little different there, but uh, may- maybe even like an Alana Yip, right? Because on commentary, Alana was saying like she goes to China and she's like a, a superstar. She's getting asked yeah, for all these autographs. Is... And, I- and I'm sure she's a superstar in Canada too. Um, but my point is it's not based on results, that stardom. Right. And yeah, I think I think it is. It is like a that's that's kind of a, a t- like you're referencing kind of this like system that I'm trying to like see if I can arrange how I kind of tier athletes over their career. And if we take legend as like this top spot, which to me, I kind of, I've been going back and forth of whether or not we should expect to see a legendary climber, like once every five years, once every 10 years. Like, I don't know how, how rare that kind of designation should be, but below that would be like a superstar below that would be a star climber. And then, and then like below that. And it is tough because for us, the term superstar often has a lot more to do with, um, uh, with like cultural awareness and like who knows you, who's, who's aware of you rather than what you've actually done. Right. Um, so that so, is tough. so. Where does Jesse fall on that list? Because I think she's an interesting case. Because I go to the gym. I mentioned Yanya. Everybody knows Yanya. I mentioned Miho. Everybody knows Miho. You mentioned Jesse, and I would argue mm-hmm. that, like, it it doesn't. She doesn't have that same resonance, and yet, hugely credentialed in terms of results. Somewhat. Olympian, uh, uh, right? Olympian. Um, t- 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 no language barrier. I know that that sometimes can become an issue. She s- speaks perfect english uh, where yeah I, I guess i'll just throw it back to you where do you put her on that on that tier system yeah and, this, and, and more importantly why do you put her where you do and maybe why not 
higher. Yeah, I, I was going to say for for what I think right now, I think I, I it would be hard to distinguish between whether or not she is a, a star or a superstar climber. Like in 2023, it's kind of tough. But I think if if we were to say her career ended like right now, this was her final competition. And I look back at her achievements and I say, OK, she won a World Cup overall. Janky season or not. She is a world champion. She has won event gold medals, even though the last time she won one was 2018, quite a long time ago. Um, you would say like with those three accomplishments on an international level, especially noting the era that she did those in, where she has mostly come up and performed under the shadow of the most dominant female lead climber in a very long time, not actually a very long time, but like since the, 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 the Jane and Mina smothering where just like you were locked out of the top two. Um, guess what? You came up in the era of Yanya Garnbrett, one of the most incredible climbers to ever exist. Um, part of me says that like going off just her results and having ex- like expecting her to win more gold medals in this era is actually possibly too high of a bar to hold to somebody given this like uh, is, is it Andy Murray is that the name of the tennis player who's kind of considered like this potential great but like look at who he came up with kind of thing I, I, am I remembering that name right is that yeah absolutely he's he's a, a huge talent hugely credentialed and yet he had the the bad luck or whatever you want to call it and and he there were some people that argue his skills surpass some of these in, in a certain sense but that's all splitting hairs yeah he came up in the era of roger federer rafael nadal and it's like man this is right. just like unlucky because yeah. any other era this guy would be like you know yeah far away number one yeah so i think i think i i think that really like colors it a little bit and if if it ended all now i think i'd be pretty comfortable with her being labeled as a superstar given the the kind of like competitors that she's having to deal with um she's very consistent she's always at the top she's always in finals like she's an excellent competitor um i would probably put her like at the moment like based on the uh, form from the last couple of years, but I should also say like, uh, uh, Olympian, I forgot to mention that when I was talking about her uh, achievements as well, even though it was combined Olympics and we can always forget about that. Um, yeah, I, I, at the like present day, I would probably call her a star climber. Um, but she probably deserves something closer to a superstar level given the like historical context, I think. Yeah. And I just, I look at all those, res- all those accolades, like you mentioned, Olympian consistent gold medals, and I'm like, man, this she should be like like one of the big names in the sport. And I know she is, but I mean like I'm talking like, you know, mm-hmm. top five or whatever, top three, Jessica Pills. And I don't think she's quite there. And I don't know why that is. I I, I and and There's too many I, like again, she hasn't won a gold medal since and she's only won like three or four silvers yeah. in the last five seasons like she has not been a consistent podium finisher that is that is like a false idea of what her actual history is right now like we've been dealing with other names we're dealing with yanni garbrett we're dealing with Cheyenne so we're dealing with in lead climbing briefly natalia grossman and of course now i mori and and this incredible like generation of climbers coming out of the early 2000s like she's she's not somebody that i would pick as like a a guaranteed podium finisher i've got a bunch of names ahead of her for that so so i i don't think she deserves any more recognition right now than she gets i think we should respect like you know again the context she's come up with but i do think that the field is kind of leaving her behind as time goes on that's i think that's true yeah i mean you're that's a good point i'm looking at her results now first at the world games in 2022 which i that's such a it's always a kind of a diminished field so i don't put much stock in that yeah uh first at the world championships in the combined in 2021 um in moscow one of the worst attended yep. world championships in history yep uh and then the yeah like the china open in 2018 first place again like diminished field get that money get that get that yeah. china open money baby. uh Xi 2018 she was a first at that lead world cup uh but that's to your point is 2018 that's like it's getting it's to be kind of ancient history, ago, yeah, in terms of comp results. So, yeah. um, and she did a uh, Innsbruck. She she got a lead also. So 2018 is very clearly her her best year uh, so far, and that is getting 
with every passing season that is getting longer and longer. It is ago. in the rearview mirror by quite a lot. Like that yeah. is that is uh yeah. You look at some of the other names involved in those seasons and you're like, oh, you're not around anymore. Like this, who, would, this, uh, you know. who would have thought that a discussion that began with let's talk about Jessica Pills winning the lead overall season becomes a discussion of did Jessica Pills performatively peak in the year two thousand and eighteen? Sure, why not? Let's drag Anna Verhoeven into this. Like, yeah. you know, who's watching comp climbing right now that knows the name Anna Verhoeven? Yeah. Not, who's not who's watching man. who's watching the debrief now that was this this into the Wu Jang World Cup? They've That's all what I Yeah, they yeah, exactly. Who's still, who's still tuned into this deep dive? God bless you if you yeah. are. Um yeah, is there is there anything else you want to break down? Like, I mean, we should we should throw Serato some some respect. I mean, again, like we mentioned at last <laughs> last week possibly, I still think in my opinion, Liv Sansos actually deserves the recognition of first person to win both the Boulder and the lead season overall, even though the Boulder wasn't quite technically a World Cup at that point. But it it is like a, a huge achievement on paper. Um, he had great seasons in both disciplines. Um, if you take the Boulder season as like a standalone, does it rank even in like the top 10 best seasons ever? No. It was a good season, but against who you're competing against and all that stuff he did he did good enough um actually a really good lead season though like uh i think i think demonstrated that he is like uh uh like he is one of the top five contenders and given the field that we've seen he's probably the favorite at this point for um uh for winning these comps when he shows up so i think that's very cool given it's his first season that's a really big achievement to get to be considered the favorite the people that people uh, to be the person that people are scared of is is actually pretty cool that's a, a really big deal yeah let me let me pull up his results here um while we're talking about results let's get him up here yeah just off off the fly um just looking just on my on my table but yeah in terms of lead we first saw him on the podium uh at chamonix where he came third and then he won Briançon. he came second at the world championships and then won Koper and wu jang so for five Oof. comps in a row he was on the podium and for three of those five he was gold medal almost a truly legendary season yeah. uh, i think there is one one thing that uh, kind of is a, a little blot on his season. I'm gonna. Do, can you guess what it what it is? I mean, in the, I feel in like the current a... era, the current era that we're in. Think about what the masses care about. Well, I feel like time. I'm not quite sure which which way. I feel like there's a few different ways that you could go. So I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure where. I, I'll just let you take it because I'm not sure. Well, which... he didn't he didn't qualify for the Olympics. Oh, okay. Right? I wasn't sure if you were just going to talk about yeah. the field or the Olympic qualification or what. But okay, yeah, because cool. you you go back to the, the some of the great to compare him. I know this is risky to compare him to somebody like Yanya, though. You go back to it the is. great <laughs> seasons, the, and and I, I don't mean to do it beyond just what I'm about to say here. That you go yeah. back to like some of her great seasons. And she ticked all the boxes, right? It's like she, right. she wins here, she wins here, and she qualifies for the Olympics, or and she wins the Olympics. And so it's like this season, Surat, like unworldly results, like wins Boulder overall, wins lead overall, ah, but he he barely, he barely missed. And I and I still think personally, I think he'll. I mean, it's not going out on a limb to say he has a good. I shot think he's still. the most likely uh, Japanese climber left to get that last spot, but yes. that is a. You know, it's still a but, bit of a coin toss. Y'all yeah, be careful. It's, it's a bit of a coin toss, and he wasn't he he whatever. It seemed like people are saying he got a little nervous, maybe at the World Championships. Maybe you know he's only 16 years old, but I think that like if he had qualified for the Olympics on top of all this other stuff in this mm -hmm. season, I like I'd be sitting down right now being like I got to write a book about Serato's 2023 right. <laughs> season, right? Because this is this is just incredible. Yeah. The, the the amazing youth phenom here. He didn't qualify for those Olympics. That's that's too bad. But I don't want that to detract from just the incredible season that he's had. Obviously, we we should also mention that like if you had if if this World Championships had worked the way last year's or not last year last uh, Olympics World Championships had worked, he would have qualified by now, yeah. right? We're taking way fewer athletes through this World Championship, so it is like the the bar is slightly different. Um, and even if he <laughs> going back to the previous Olympics, even if he hadn't qualified. Being from Japan, they might have, uh, they might have held still... somebody and tried to get Serato into that Olympic spot anyway. Even Good if, reference. If anybody remembers the uh, the whole debacle yeah. with the Japanese Federation and all that, but yeah, yeah. Good reference. Uh, 
good stuff from Serato. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it just builds intrigue for next season. And you got to wonder, what's he going to be? He was so good this season. What's he going to be like when he actually has now a season of experience under his belt? Is he going to be even better? Or the flip side, which we've seen before too, is his rookie season going to be his high watermark mm-hmm. and uh and he can't ever match that we've seen that in the men's and the and the women's division with some other competitors uh that's going to be an interesting question mark going into next season if 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 months from now if i'm putting together a recap of or, or if i'm putting together an article of like the most intriguing questions heading into 2024 the 2024 world cup season first and foremost on that list is is Serato and Raku going to match the results or surpass the res- results that yeah. he did in 2023? And, and we just know it's going to be very hard to, it's probably going to be very hard to compare apples to apples because, okay, does does he have to do the Olympic qualification series? Then we spend the first bunch of months of the season in a combined context. And let's say he's already qualified and he does do the World Cups. So what kind of field is going to be at those World Cups? Are they going to be quite diminished uh, like we've experienced this season? Um, so it's going to be tough. But um, it's it's just going to have to be eye test and see, like, is this kid still, uh, still super strong and still a top contender? But... Yeah. Or, or would he follow the Alberto Hines Lopez playbook and actually participate in a lot of World Cups mm-hmm. leading up to the Olympics, presuming he qualifies for the Olympics? Yeah. And uh, is Alberto proved that, that that's not the conventional type way to do it, right? Most people are like, you take your foot off the gas in terms of World Cups as the Olympics are approaching. What is, there's no there's no Spanish word for tapering. That's, yeah. that's the problem. It doesn't translate across, right? Yeah. Alberto said, uh, I see you're tapering and I'll, I'll raise you an Olympic gold medal. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Spanish culture famous for going super hard all the time. And uh, yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. Um, the only other one, I, I, I think I already said it, but I just want to give a shout out as an American viewer to the American speed climbers that did show up for this event. We got... A really intriguing, probably the the American highlight was when Zach Hammer lined up against Sam Watson in the, I think it was the one eighth final for the speed, and it was too bad. I think Zach slipped, uh, and then Sam advanced, and then I think he missed the buzzer in his race against Peng Wu in the next bracket. But um, all credit to both of them for making that long flight, for giving some, <laughs> giving a little intrigue for those American viewers that were very hungry to cheer for some Americans at this event on the live stream. Few and far between. Yeah, that's uh, one of the like brutal seating things where you're like, yeah, we flew, you know, thousands of miles just for one of us to have to kick the other out. Like tough, yeah. tough stuff. Yeah, and Sam Watson ending. Uh, am I remembering right? Ending on the season podium, or am I am I uh, blanking? I've got it right in front of me. I just need to actually pull it up. Yeah, third place, third place, third place on the season podium. Huge deal for a teenager. That's like a uh, is uh, that should be the first American man to end up on the season podium for uh, for speed climbing. I'm pretty sure. I, I, yeah. I would think it would have to be. I, I didn't think about it earlier, but yeah, I'm pretty sure you're on top. Yeah, there's no nobody else. Yeah. yeah. Way yeah, to, great way to stuff break from, it. No, speaking of, you know, intrigue for next season, let's see what Sam can do when he's got a whole another year of training under his belt. And yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. Um, it feels like an unceremonious way to end the season just just with this but i mean shout out to everybody that competed and you know, i feel like i'm giving the speech at the end of a local competition where you're like yeah and a round of applause for the volunteers and uh safe drive home everybody and thanks so much see you next yeah, year it does feel weird like, right like this is how the season concludes with kind of a, a comp that a lot of people weren't really into a uh, diminished competitor field uh, it kind of ended with a whimper rather than fireworks mm-hmm. or something like that yeah. But, um, and I think, I think for some people, it may feel like the season is not going to end. Like for the climbers, I think it's going to feel like this just keeps on going. Right. Cause we got to go through the, the continentals and then the OQS. So, but we gotta, we gotta like close out the official world cup season somehow. Right. So we, we do have to call it, um, just, uh, I, I just wanted to throw something out there. This of course marks the end of our fifth season of doing the debrief it started in 2019 and we covered 2020 as as short-lived of a season that was but we did some athlete interviews and then we did 21 we did 22 and now we finished 23 five years um i'm not going to ask for your reflections but what i am going to ask you is um i think when we started out we used to do this thing where we would grade the world cup like a letter grade like a like from school and so i, I just wanted to throw out to you we never ever defined 
the the rubric for this ever. It was shoddy as hell. But give me give me your letter grade for Wu Jang, and any reflections you have on on five years of this storied podcast. Well, I think the I don't the first grade that comes to my mind is like a C C plus, yeah. just very very average, uh, nothing like nothing dreadful. I mean, there, I, I, I'm a, I'm a pretty critical of production snafus because I think at this point, 2023 Olympic sport, all that stuff, you really shouldn't, you should, it should be a pretty clean production. So I guess that that detracts a little bit, but I don't think it merits being in like the D or the F territory. Hmm. Uh, we still got to see some stars, right? Miroslaw was there and, and I Mori and Serato. So, uh, but at the same time, for all those reasons we said at the beginning, I don't think it raises to like, certainly not to a territory. And I don't even think it gets into like B B plus area because, um, I, I don't know. There are just such so few highlights for me. So yeah, I'll give it a C C plus. Um, and I want to hear your grade too. I guess just reflections. This has just been uh, on a on a real sincere note. It's been uh, you and I talk as a lot about even off mic about how much fun we have doing this. But the really great thing is to see that people respond to this. That there's an audience for this. That people enjoy listening to us just riff on this because um, it does feel like a. Like, I think community is the this word that gets tossed around too much in climbing circles, but it does really feel like there's a great community of people that are really into this, and that kind of makes it all worth it. I love that people respond in the comments, whether they like what we say, whether we don't like what they say. I'm just happy that they're engaged in the conversation and they feel like they're a part of it. Uh, so it's just, uh, I really appreciate you as the host of this thing, and I appreciate everybody that's listening as a participatory audience in this thing. And it's been a lot of fun, and and because people like it, I think we'll continue to do it. And I, that I love that because I love doing this. So that's yeah, what, would, that's how I close out the five year mark. Yeah, I would I would probably give this comp like a. I feel like in 2019 when we started, I probably would have given this something like a C plus. I think because there were more frequent technical snafus and, and it was just like a bit more of a mess on average back then. So it would probably wouldn't have ranked as low, but at this point, especially given the context of it, I am in D territory. Um, like this is pretty close to a failing grade. Um, and I don't think most of it is like the IFSC's fault. So I'm not like, I'm, I don't have a list of suggestions necessarily on how to fix it, but as, as a viewer, this was definitely the least impressive and I would not recommend to anybody to watch this comp if they're wondering what to do with two hours just go rewatch your favorite movie like you know whatever um yeah in terms of in terms of five years it was uh um the, the nice thing about this is um you know this used to be and not the debrief specifically but plastic weekly used to be an audio podcast and i switched to video because i i wanted to just get more practice at being on camera and doing a lot of uh speaking live and trying to be a bit more coherent not feel the pressure of the camera try and keep things light and concise and be entertaining because i want to do more commentary and while the comp scene is absolutely dried up and the opportunities to be a commentator have almost disappeared entirely uh, it's still a fun skill set that I've been able to kind of work on and, and identify my weaknesses and try to fix them. Although I've identified way more than I've actually been able to fix. This whole thing has been a great learning process from technical skills to just getting to talk with somebody and, and refine our thoughts and our thinking about comp climbing has been a blast. And, and I think the cherry on top is the guests and the, the handful of people that bother to watch. Um, someone in the discord said something along the lines of like, you know, this is, it is way more fun watching competition climbing when you have somebody else to talk about it with. I think they were kind of like new to this and, and realized that it is more fun, not necessarily our Discord in particular, but just like having somebody else to just shoot the shit and make jokes and and actually just like share the experience rather than be on your laptop watching the World Cups by yourself. Um, and so that that is uh, that feels good that we've found like a, a, a niche of people that get to enjoy the sport with us which is very cool as as uh as small as that may be just finding one another is really valuable so yeah john i appreciate you doing it for these five years and i can't wait to do more um with that we'll probably be doing a debrief i don't know maybe like once a month ish for the next little while because there are of course other competitions we're not going to go you know super hard in the paint for for some of these continental qualifiers uh but we'll still be around we'll still do some stuff uh in between and then we'll see how it pans out with with the OQS, maybe we'll do a lot, maybe we won't. Um, but of course, 
course, uh, you know, unless unless uh, unless the water rises and and the the the, the asteroids come, we'll probably be back for uh, for April twenty twenty four. Uh, and I like that you've started to do, I don't know if people look into the past videos that you've done, but you've started to do the tier, the lists of best best kits, best jerseys and, and whatnot. You it'll like be, a good list, eh? It'll be fun to think of some, or people can suggest things in the comments if they have ideas of, of lists that uh, that they want to see you, you ponder, uh, you know, riff about. Uh, put them in the comments because I enjoyed I enjoy your lists. I'll try to keep up a bit of content. Yeah, and as and just as another shout out, uh, listen to John Bergman's uh, most recent interview on Climbing Business Journal. He interviews actually my um, my owner, the guy that owns me, um, Jean Marc Delaplante, owns a bunch of Canadian gyms, and I really like that you took the conversation towards competition organization and the struggles of organizing like local and regional comps. I'm really happy you guys talked about that because he's a great person to discuss that with. So if you're interested in like competition infrastructure at a sub world cup level he's a, a really interesting guy to listen to because he's been experiencing it for like 20 years um so uh, that was a great interview and i thought and I, this is just you know patting each other on the back but the first like two minutes of that podcast emphasize how how good of a host you are becoming like you are reaching the territory where i want you to be the person that introduces some of these competitions it is it is so cheerful it is so bright it is so welcoming and i instantly have a smile on my face and this could be all slanted because i have the pleasure of knowing you and talking to you all the time but i i i think you're becoming an extraordinary host um so i hope you keep doing more podcast stuff because you sound great and it's fun to listen to thank you very much that's very kind of you to say and and i guess i'll just say like everybody in the world i'm a i'm a work in progress trying to get better sure so. Thanks a lot. Let's leave it at that. Thank you, everybody, for watching for another year of The Debrief. Of course, you can always like and subscribe. You can support on Patreon. Or most importantly, the cold winter months of very few comps are coming. So come hang out with us in the Plastic Weekly Discord. We'll try and keep some conversation going and, uh, and, and shoot the shit. Otherwise, however long it may be until the next one, we will see you in the next one.